Welcome back. Uh, and now it's my turn and what a great hand I've been dealt here. We have a super panel lined up to guide us through some of the opportunities and challenges facing the investment sector. We have Ewan Sterling from Aberdeen Standard, who has kindly come in place of Keith Skior, who can't be with us today. Uh, Manuela Sperandeo from BlackRock. Saka Nusebi from Federated Hermes. And last but far from least, Michelle Giddens from Bridge Investment Management. Now, do remember, if you have any questions for this great panel, please fire away in the question box on your screen. We're expecting a fair torrent of questions, so the earlier you get them in, the better. And do remember to spread the word on Twitter at Finance for Change and using the has hashtag Ethical Finance 2020. Can I ask Ewan to fire away, please? And thank you, Ewan, indeed, for joining us at such short notice. Ewan is Head of Sustainability and ESG. That's a slightly shortened job title um, at Aberdeen Standard. Ewan, how do you see the coming months and years shaping up? A very broad question to get us going. It is indeed, George, and thank you for that, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we spoke yesterday about the challenges and opportunities that COVID has brought us as investors, and it's a useful reminder that when the picture looks really bleak with problems all around you, human ingenuity often intervenes to present a range of potential solutions that we are able to harness as investors. Now, clearly climate change is one of the biggest challenges facing us as a society, let alone as investors. But while the risks associated with transition are substantial, so are the opportunities as new industries, new processes and new demand patterns emerge. I mean, just this week, um, the sale of electric and hybrid vehicles in the UK eclipsed those of diesel cars. And I thought that particular transition would take many more years to reach this point. And that brings me back to COVID. Um, I've been working in the ESG field for the last four years, but I've always regarded myself as a long term investor. For me, the integration of ESG factors into investment processes is simply the amplification of long term investment factors in what can be a really complex decision. But what happens when the long term suddenly accelerates towards you and is able to metaphorically slap you in the face? Well, that's what COVID has done in, in my view and things that we thought might take a generation to achieve have happened in front of our eyes. This has resulted in a mix of challenges, but also opportunities as much as the management of any long-term issue has. So admittedly at the moment with COVID, the challenges are dominating people's thoughts as many businesses struggle to cope with significant demand shocks and huge uncertainty. Sadly, this feels likely to continue until we learn to live in a sustainable way with the virus because eradication feels a long way off. As investors, we've faced parallel challenges to those of the businesses and assets that we support. Which businesses or assets do you continue to support when the demand picture is so uncertain and you have to ration capital? Is the demand shock that you've just witnessed temporary or is it permanent? Um, if it's temporary, how much support will the enterprise need to reach that period when demand recovers? So as an investor, it's worth remembering that the markets in which we operate have a primary purpose, and that's the ready supply of capital to deserving businesses or development opportunities. Despite the fact that most of our time is spent dealing in secondary securities, we have to be ready and we have to be prepared for times like these when many of the activities that we support have an urgent need for that capital. So what do we do now? Well, news updates have familiarised us with the issues faced by pret a amongst others, many similar businesses, empty offices, quiet town centres, decimating demand. Is that demand going to recover? Less well publicised are the efforts of some companies to make exceptional bonus awards to executive teams while they're trying to lay off thousands of workers and even questioning the business's survival. That's quite an easy decision for us in terms of voting. But what about uh, the emergence of working from home versus attending an office every working day? Again, I would characterise this as the acceleration of an existing trend rather than something that's totally new. Is demand for offices permanently impaired? We think not. Has the market bifurcated into the good and the bad? Well, that's much more likely in our view. So while the ability to get back into the office in the short term is very uncertain and old fashioned offices, with outdated workspaces have rightly fallen in value. We've actually seen values rise where flexible, modern, wellness focused workspaces can be offered. So our real estate investors believe that by putting ES and G factors at the top of their investment agenda, 
they can harness significant opportunities in a market that has been as seriously disrupted as that of city centre offices. So while there's no doubt that we have significant challenges to address at both macroeconomic and microeconomic levels, keeping a really close eye on longer term factors can really help in establishing a path through the current difficulties towards a sustainable and most importantly, a financially beneficial future. Ewan, thank you. A great optimistic start to this uh, session. Manuela, you've been deeply involved in developing uh, ESG client offerings at BlackRock. Do you think that ESG has passed the COVID-19 test and will it, will it survive, um, well, in the long term, but in the short term, will it survive current problems? This is uh, a question. Thank you. Thank you, George. This is a question that uh, we've been receiving uh, uh, increasingly often since, since the start of the crisis. And I think by now there is no doubt that uh, we can all agree that uh, uh, sustainable products have really passed the COVID test. And I would really like to highlight two key factors that uh, point us in this direction. And uh, to some extent, build on the resilience topic from the previous session, which uh, we think is very applicable also in in the field of uh, sustainable investment products. Um, so the first one would be resilience in terms of flows. And um, to illustrate that, uh, I would like to point out to the flows that we have seen in the exchange traded fund space, where we actually have uh, very uh, live data, which gets updated on a daily basis. And for us, it was incredibly interesting to observe that um, even at the peak of the crisis, where we had seen massive reallocation on these frequently traded instruments, um, to, the, to the magnitude of like over 35 billion in outflow at one point uh, across March, um, everything relating to the sustainable alternative of ETF products um, we're not experiencing any outflow at all. We could actually record only one week of negative flows in this category. So clearly this pointed to uh, two facts in my mind. First, that uh, the allocation that investors increasingly were making to these products, and again, this is just a sub-segment of the market, but we find uh, it has actually been the case across also the active space and uh, more broadly for other investment vehicles. So the allocation that these investors were doing were very strategic in nature and very long term. And, um, and also, I think uh, the breadth of adoption was really expanding from what used to be just an asset owner topic to the broader wealth and retail audience. So a lot of the model portfolios that are distributed to wealth clients were starting to have sustainable allocation at the core of the portfolio construction. So this has been the first very interesting um, phenomenon that we have been uh, witnessing. The second factor that uh, have really pointed at this resilience has been the performance element. Widely debated on the press, there is no doubt. This is a very nascent uh, um, area for the investment industry to really get uh, its head around. But I think the initial evidence has been very encouraging in that uh, strategies that were um, really over allocating to companies with good uh, standing from an environmental, social and governance perspective measured by different data providers had actually outperformed both uh, uh, broad market benchmarks and also uh, lower ESG counterpart in terms of uh, uh, product alternatives. Uh, again, this is something that is very recent, but I think uh, it has uh, also created a bit more confidence for investors to approach uh, some of these investment solutions, which arguably are uh, quite nascent uh, in, uh, um, in terms of the available track record. Uh, so we see this trend, uh, to answer your question, uh, only accelerating. Uh, I look after the indexing side in terms of product development and uh, earlier in the year we came up with a projection so if we think that the industry was already coming from what was a record year 2019 um, where we had actually crossed the 250 billion in terms of assets, uh, speaking about indexing, we estimate in the next 10 years uh, for assets uh, actually to uh, growth at a speed of an extra 1 trillion and what underpins this uh, trajectory in our mind is a set of uh, forces. Uh, the first force uh, is undeniably the improvement that we've made in terms of data. As I said, we now have multiple data provider 
that power the construction of these investment solutions. And uh, we also see a push towards this data provider to converge in terms of better standardization. So this makes easier for investors to compare uh, information coming from multiple data provider because there, there is a big drive towards uh, enhanced transparency. Again, it's far from perfect, it's very nascent, but uh, there is definitely, if we compare the coverage that we enjoy now vis-a-vis -vis what we had five years ago, it's really exponential, the improvement that we have on data. Um, the second point I would make is uh, the one around materiality and what, in, what I mean by that is this notion of return. Again, over a, re over a recent past, but of course something that is starting to establish itself and I think more and more research is now concentrating to what has been driving these uh, outperformance. Um, I think the notion of choice and availability is a very important one. We as a firm earlier in the year made big commitments on the investment that we're going to make on the product side in really providing choice for every type of sustainable need. Uh, from divestment all the way to transition, a big topic as uh, we have just uh, heard. And then last but not least, uh, the regulatory drive. I think uh, the, it's, really, uh, it's really spread across uh, regions. Uh, we see that, uh, of course, by the work of the European Commission is uh, incredibly important now in the UK pension segment. Um, but I think also a big push, uh, uh, not only for better reporting, but I think also to improve around the stakeholders management and communication. Um, in the UK in particular, when we think about pensions and DC schemes, increasingly we're seeing greater awareness by scheme members around their carbon financial footprint, which I think is an awareness that is quite recent, but is really now um, taking pace. So we are all aware that uh, our biggest financial footprint is really relating to our pension. And so what does it mean in terms of the ESG consideration that our pension needs to bear in mind? I think that's very interesting. I think only solidifies the case for this trend only accelerating going forward. So to answer your question, I believe uh, sustainable investing has really passed the COVID test. And I think to Ian's earlier point uh, is really brought the urgency, has really created the urgency for this trend to only accelerate going forward. Good news. Thank you. More optimism. Thank you, Manuela. Saka, do you share this optimism? And can I just say, welcome, of course, but I hope you haven't come into the office specially to speak to us today. I would feel rather um, I, I, guilty I, about that. I, I come to office um, sometimes so um, because I have to work there. So I, I'd like to take a slightly different view. I mean, I, I'd like to go into into more philosophical realm, if, if, if I may, since this is the ethical financial thing and, and less about trying to tell you what we do and how you should buy some of my funds, which is Wonderful, of course, but that's not the point. And and I want to start with two things. One is something that you mentioned, uh, Adam Smith. People really should read Adam Smith. There is a sort of a trend that's obviously growing in ESG. Some um, 30 years ago, uh, my predecessor in this firm stood alone in, in, in doing and integrating ESG and stewardship uh, in 83 when it started. Um, uh, Ralph Katani and then, of course, Alistair Ross Scooby. And now it's a field that everybody's in it, and, and we've seen the wonderful work that Standard has done in it, and BlackRock has done it, and others, and you know the market's moving more towards impact. And there's a sort of a feeling, I think, that somehow this is new, that this is a new interpretation of uh, capitalism, and it isn't. And so I'm going to do my favorite, if I may, which is I'm going to read to you from Adam Smith's On Moral Sentiment, The Theory of Moral Sentiment, which you mentioned. Uh, uh, the, uh, in the last session. Uh, and I apologize, um, uh, Adam Smith, of course, was writing in the 18th century and he's a sexist, therefore he talks in the male gender only. Uh, and therefore, please, this does not reflect me, it just reflects him. Uh, and he talks about the rational man, ultimately, the rational person. He is sensible, he being the rational person, is sensible too that his own interest is connected with the prosperity of society. Notice, with the prosperity of society, not of himself, of society. And that the happiness, now people are wanting to measure GDP by happiness rather than pure nominal numbers. There he was, he was at it long before us. And that the happiness, perhaps the preservation of his existence, that means his life, depends upon its, society's, prosperity's preservation. So this idea of thinking by integrating ESG, of doing impact as part of investment, 
actually was there at the foundation of the free market structure. And what has happened over the years is that we've just simply forgotten it. And I quite agree with what Yohan said, because Yohan said something key, which is the difference between integrating ESG and not integrating ESG is simply to think about, are you long-term or are you short-term? And the way that markets were talked about in the previous 10, 15, 20 years was more akin to gambling than to investing. And then you're betting on the market going up or the market going down or one segment of the market going up, one segment of the market going down. And that's not investing, that's just gambling. And there's a lot of academic work that shows, in fact, if you're going to gamble um, and you hire, uh, then go and hire uh, professional poker players in Las Vegas. And if you do so, you have a better chance of beating the benchmark uh, than almost anybody on this panel. It's just the reality. And so what we do is something more. And I, and I will disagree. I hate disagreeing with anybody on my panel because generally uh, I'm not really um, capable of doing so, but I will because I'm going to quote somebody on the previous panel. Uh, we don't allocate capital in our business. Not really. As Professor Kay has clearly shown, uh, we don't. We just buy shares in companies. I mean, technically, when we buy shares in companies that are banks, they generate money and that generates capital, but that's secondary. So the main purpose of our investment is stewardship. And stewardship is telling companies how to grow their businesses. And through stewardship, then we can grow the long term. So let me come back to the first question. Have we stood to the test of COVID? Hmm. Uh, it's too early to tell because there were only very few houses that really were integrating ESG for the 10, 15 years prior to see whether really we've managed to put up with that or not. But what we clearly can see is that society has stood up to the test of COVID. And I think that's important. Because what we've seen, particularly here in Europe, less so in the States where there's a struggle going on, uh, society is saying that the social aspect of the ESG is very important. We value the lives of all citizens. We value the well-being of all citizens. That's S. Um, the, the, uh, the deep thoughts that we had in self-searching post the death of Mr. Floyd in the States and looking at our own society and how we integrate communities, that's part of the S. And of course, you can come back and say, that just makes companies more resilient. And of course, it's clear, and we can show you that mathematically in, in our numbers, it's clear that companies that have strong cultures um, integrated with them, which is about the S part, are more resilient. But the shift here is that investors, as we've heard from Manuela, have already started to sort of wake up to the fact that long-term risks happen very quickly sometimes. Uh, society is waking up to the fact that you know, they control society partly through government and taxes and who we vote in, but partly through who we shop from, who we work for, and where we put our savings. And the ESG is more important because we want to live in a society that is more equitable, more harmonious, and more profitable in the long term. And so I will end with saying the following. ESG actually is simply a better way of getting sustainable wealth creation over the long term. What about impact? Impact is risk mitigation. It's risk mitigation because unless we shift towards impact investing as well, the disruptions in society that we've seen and which were the result of us not understanding Adam Smith and having not really read his book on moral sentiments, that disruption will continue to make the political situation actually disruptive. And what does that mean? That means regulation that stops us from being able to enhance our position. Not investing in an impactful way means that we uh, waste away resources, whether it's gender resources, whether it's ethnic resources, whether it's supply chain resources. And so the argument is if we're really in this game to try to grow wealth over the long term for the nation as a whole, and savers are simply, if you collect all the savers, you have the wealth of the nation together, to go back to Adam Smith, then you have to integrate ESG. You must practice stewardship because as an investor, that's the only thing you have. And you have to start thinking about making impactful investment because through impactful investment, you mitigate the long-term risk of social disruption, which brings the whole edifice down. So we haven't yet proven that ESG has met COVID-19, but what we've proven is that COVID-19 has brought the importance of a proper understanding of Adam Smith to the minds of ordinary citizens. And they are now telling us in the financial business and telling government, listen, it's time that we create wealth sustainably for the whole of society.
That, I think, is the result of the crisis. Sakir, thank back. you. Thank you, and for confirming our new role as the Adam Smith Show. It's uh, tremendous. I'd like to come back to some of these issues of stewardship and measurement that you've mentioned, but you particularly picked up there on impact investment. Michelle, this is where your great expertise comes in on what's happening to impact during COVID-19 and measurement. Are we getting better, as we think we are, at measuring the impact of our impact investments? Thank Michelle, you, welcome. George. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, um, and um, uh, I'll try to draw together some strands of what the former speakers have said. And I, I, giving the, my answer to your initial question, um, I think that COVID is resulting, I think we can already say that COVID is resulting in more flows of capital to ESG managed portfolios, but also the requirement, I think, on ESG practitioners and impact investors to go up a gear. In terms of their, uh, in terms of the way that they operate, and, and I think this is happening um, for three reasons. So one is that COVID has brought a spotlight on the social challenges. Saka talked about this a little bit. Has really shone a very bright spotlight on some of the social inequities, some of the social challenges that we have as a society, and that our current um, form of capitalism is leaving in its wake. At the beginning, I remember people saying that COVID was going to be the great leveler. It has been exactly the opposite, as we know. It has um, been, been worse among lower income populations. It has been worse among communities of colour. It has been harder on people in lower paying jobs. And so it's really clearly shone a light on some of the um, some of the uh, inequities that um, we we're going to need to solve. So it has put a spotlight on the challenges number one, and that has we're starting to see is really raising um, what was already a growing interest among uh, a range of investors in aligning their investments with their values and breaking away from the from the idea that. They, they care about society, they care about the planet, but when they make investments, they forget all of that. And you start to see um, some really exciting moves um, there in terms of investors, um, even to the level of pension funds. Manuela was talking about pension funds. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in the creation of an initiative called Make My Money Matter, which is um, fostering an interest among uh, the general public in the fact that they actually have power in this question of how we're going to run our capitalism, our global capitalism, because pension funds own a huge portion of that global capitalism and we're starting to see interest from pensioners in actually you know all, all this money is is invested somewhere how is it invested and is it helping to solve these problems that we've just seen this huge spotlight on so i think that um we talk a lot about flows of capital from sophisticated investors um, into ESG uh, quoted funds, but if you you know, it, I think it's really democratizing now. We're starting to see individuals interested in where their money is, and that in turn is going to create a huge um, uh, additional focus on this issue. So a spotlight on the challenges. Secondly, COVID has given us a bit of a sense of how fast things can be achieved if they feel like a real emergency. And it felt like a real emergency. Government has, uh, you know, this government has changed from um, a government of um, austerity into a government of high spending. Um, and I think a lot of people are wondering whether we could um, perhaps treat the climate emergency as more of an emergency. And maybe maybe there's a need to act more urgently on that. And, and, and what's the role of investment in that? And you see uh, a huge, a huge progress, I think. Um, and we talk about measurement. We are starting to see huge um, improvements in terms of at least environmental, environmental measurement and moves for greater transparency in terms of environmental impact of companies. It's perhaps one of the more, more easy uh, impacts on society to measure. And so we are seeing progress there. So there's been a sense of what can be achieved. And then uh, Manuela talked about it. There's also the question of performance. So I know from our own investment, so we are a private um, funds investor, investing in growth businesses and real estate and, and, and things like um, social outcomes contracts. And if you look at the 60 investments we have across the house, the vast majority have been resilient. They've been resilient 
really simply because they are responding to driving social needs. So they're working on um, getting people out of uh, rough sleeping into, into housing or providing home care um, uh, for elderly or vulnerable people. And when you're meeting strong societal needs, then you tend to be more resilient. And that um, performance has also been shown both in SACA's long term, I think. So I saw a very interesting article by George Seraphim, uh, who's a finance professor at Harvard in the Harvard Business Review, perhaps my colleagues have also seen it, where he and a colleague analyzed the performance of more than 2000 US companies over 21 years. And he found something very interesting. He found that those firms that improved on material ESG significantly outperformed their competitors. So that's over the long term. What he also found, which I thought was particularly interesting, was those that outperformed on immaterial ESG issues slightly underperformed their competitors. He also, by the way, found that during the collapse of the stock markets at the time of COVID, that again, those kinds of companies that had a strong ESG performed better. But just to finish, I suppose, what I think we're going to need to see, there's, there's a lot of concern about um, as, as more people talk about ESG, more ESG, more greenwashing. They talk about SDG, rainbow washing. And I do think we're at a point now where we're past the point of whether ESG and measurement of impact on society is going to be part of investment decisions. It just is. Uh, now the question is how? Uh, and that brings me, I think, to, to, your, to the final part of, of, of my remarks. I think ESG and and, and the practice of impact measurement that came from impact investing are kind of coming together in a consensus that we now need a shared set of standards, shared metrics, um, so that we can get real transparency about companies, how they actually are behaving, and so that a whole host of investors can start analyzing more transparent and more uh, standardized data than they are able to at the moment. And it needs to be focused on what is most material to the companies. We need to move away from a, a box ticking form of ESG that has developed where it's mostly just risk mitigation. And it's kind of, I've got to check all the boxes across the whole of the business to make sure there's no risk into focusing on what is most material for this particular business. Firstly, because changing those things for the better is what makes a difference to people and planet, but it's also what's going to create competitive advantage for that company. Um, and, and, and secondly, because um, those are the most important things to, to measure and manage. So um, I will, I'll stop there. Um, and, and I wish you wouldn't, it's great, but thank you, tremendous. We'll come back to you in just a moment. Can I give you some great news, which is that Richard Curtis of Make My Money Matter um, is actually appearing on the Adam Smith channel here uh, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, is, that, is that Richard Curtis, the uh, film director and so on? So we're very much looking forward to him. Can I ask, as a boring chartered accountant, all of you about this question that a number of you have raised on transparency? We had a talk yesterday afternoon by another boring accountant, very good friend, Michael Manelli, Professor Michael Manelli, um, Sheriff of the City of London. Michael and I worked on a project a few years ago called Confidence Accounting, essentially disbelieving some of the numbers that were in huge, particularly banks, um, annual reports and accounts, and suggesting that what one needed was a greater sense of probability of what a number was, rather than saying a number was actually precisely right. Is there a sense maybe that um, the growing volume of data being quite reasonably required by regulators about E and S and G measures um, is creating too much data to be analysed properly. You and I, I got your title wrong earlier. I do apologise. I used to be a journalist, so it's it's part of the trade to get things wrong. But you're actually head of stewardship rather than sustainability. But do you have a sense that this regulatory burden might not achieve quite the ends it's meant to? Or am I being cynical here? Um, slightly cynical, George. Um, I think the regulatory burden is very well intentioned, um, but we need to watch out for the outcomes. Uh, so I, I know that the companies that we invest in are, are subject to many different pressures, and particularly at the moment, one of them is on, on uh, disclosure and reporting. 
And uh, e even uh, across the world of responsible investing, there are so many different demands on them. So what we try to encourage the companies to do is choose a framework and stick with it. And uh, there is an effort uh, amongst the, the different sustainable frameworks like SASB uh, and the Global Re Reporting Initiative to try and harmonize. And we, we think that's a great thing. But the companies need to be aware of what the material risks are to them. And I think this point has been emphasized by the other uh, panelists. Materiality is absolutely key here. And if a company doesn't understand its environmental risks or the, the material environmental risks, then it's in real trouble. Uh, and it should be held to account uh, for its mismanagement of those risks. Um, and, and that's what we would like to see uh, is a more conscious um, exposition of what the company's risks uh, are, uh, what, what, what risks they're facing and how they're managing or mitigating those risks uh, for the benefit of long-term sustainable returns. Um, I think regulators are focused on that same outcome, um, but it, it, it looks and feels different in different parts of the world. Do others feel confident in the figures that are being produced by companies in terms of being able to use them to challenge um, their approaches to e and s and g matters or responsible finance more generally? Saka. So, uh, I mean, I, <clears throat> I'm not an accountant, although I've been a fund manager for most of my 33-year career. Um, and I think you have to approach uh, numbers slightly carefully. Um, uh, and um, where I would go is, of course, you need some, uh, I agree with, with Michelle, we need some formal standards and we support TCFD, for example, as a way of, of at least having a standard of declaration of, of, of transparency towards carbon. But I think what we've now realized and what COVID brings to, 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 to highlight is that the risks within companies are not just to do with the financial bits of the companies, they do with culture, they do with impact, they do with, with, with um, supply chains and so on. And I think it's time we move towards much more an integrated reporting framework that actually gives us a much better idea of the whole of the company. And that gives us the opportunity to listen to what the company says it believes uh, its greater risk, risks are and how it's dealing with them, as opposed to concentrating just on numbers. And, and again, to go back in history, if you, if you allow me, the reason that, that we are so obsessed with numbers is following the, the crash of 2930, um, the regulator realized that people did not have true numbers that reflected what companies were doing. And so we passed the Companies Act. But that's just a historical accident. Uh, the company is not just the numbers. The company is much more than that. The risk and the opportunity is much more than that. The resilience we're talking about is all about people and culture and how do you put that so i think i think we've got to go beyond numbers to integrate report thank you manuela can i just can i build on oh i'm so sorry can i just quickly build on what saka said there and then pass on to manuela um i, I think we are at a very similar point to that time uh, uh, around 100 years ago where we didn't have um, globally accepted accounting principles. And although it isn't all about the numbers, I think we are at the point where if, if, this, if, if, if impact on society is going to be a key decision-making um, driver in both investments and business decisions, then we do need some kind of globally accepted sort of accounting equivalent for those impact metrics. And there is a lot of work going on on that. And I do think that within the next few years, it is possible that we will get a set of, um, uh, of global principles and global accounting standards for the measurement of, of, of impact. Um, so there's, um, at the moment, one of the obstacles that people talk to us a lot about when they are interested in, 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 in integrating impact into their investment decisions is, well, I just don't know, should I look at the SASB? You know, should I report on SASB or should I report using GRI? Or what about the impact investing um, industry and, and, and um, uh, you know, the, the, the global impact investing networks, um, IRIS data? So there is a lot of confusion, um, but I think that all of those organizations are coming together. I know they are through something called the Impact Management Project which we've got, um, we're, we're helping to facilitate through a non-profit um, arm of Bridges, which is really bringing together all of those standard setters and saying, how can we, how can we agree on a set of, uh, of global standards, which then regulators hopefully can, um, can utilize in their own regulation and, and might want to adapt for different regions. But if we could have a set of global standards, that would be that huge step forward that was taken in accountancy. And then to Saka's point, you then, 
can use those numbers to do all kinds of sophisticated analysis. And of course, it's not just about numbers. Commercial investment decisions are not just about numbers. Uh, neither are impact decisions just about numbers. But we're really going to struggle if we can't get um, something equivalent to, the, to, to a financial accounting in terms of impact measurement. I think really the I think the shift from this uh, backward looking way of looking, which, which is, uh, I mean, the standard in the investment uh, industry is all about realized return is about uh, the correlation of risk in the past, what has happened before. I think there, there needs to be uh, a mindset shift in that uh, there is no way in which this can be achieved. The data are just too new and Speaking with a lot of data providers, uh, they also acknowledge that uh, there is no point in trying to recreate the history because it would just be kind of like a backfilling exercise, which would have no scientific rigor. So I think to Michelle and Sucker's point is very much around complementing today's financial industry insights uh, and very much looking at what are going to be the standard of tomorrow, which are actually going to increasingly build a history and a data set where, which can be used by investors. But uh, again, it is actually quite critical and it is actually extra work. To go back to your earlier question, it's extra work for investors, but uh, I think we're also at a tipping point where they know it's ultimately also necessary to remain relevant for their for their clients. So what we are experiencing as we progress with efforts around the ESG integration is that uh, the conversation we're having are completely different from two years ago, whereby the old school way of investing, which would reject uh, some of these new insights, they're really opening up and they acknowledge that there is just no choice, that it's just too pressing. And so I think we're having much more open conversation also with our own investors. Thank you. Um, we're getting an awful lot of questions coming in on biodiversity, a huge theme. But for instance, I've got a lean round scene on the screen here, but Malika Bandarkar says nature and biodiversity is among the top five global risks identified in the 2020 WEF report. What steps are your, is your organization taking to understand and address this risk? I guess we're all waiting for the Das Gupta report to come out next month, uh, I guess, um, in the UK on biodiversity. Um, Who would like to lead off on this huge theme? Saka, please. And lessons from Adam Smith would be very welcome here, of course. <laughs> so it falls, it falls within the same. Look, um, um, we are, we're engaged with some other investors talking to governments because this is a place where governments can work and, and part of a bigger effort talking to the Brazilian government about uh, forestation. Um, we're engaged with companies that, that have links to forestation to try to speak to them and in general talk about the importance of biodiversity. But I think uh, this is only just beginning to hit the consciousness of people involved in investment in a major way uh, and you'd expect it to become uh, more important with time and we are putting a lot of effort trying to see how we can best influence. I think like with other things, and this has been a shift, uh, this is another shift that I think is worth highlighting. In these areas, typically speaking, people in asset management do not cooperate together. Typically speaking, we compete for clients. So um, uh, Aberdeen Standard, BlackRock and us would be at different places and we'll share to Michelle, that's all right, Bridges in a different ways, you go after different kind of clients, we're okay, but actually we're in competition. But I think what we've begun to see with the ESG efforts is cooperation. Um, uh, the C100 Plus is a very example, the biodiversity one is another example, where collectively as investors, this goes back to Adam Smith, we are approaching governments and approaching companies to try to say to them, look, um, this is important and we've got to try to preserve it because the dangers to us uh, as a species are quite huge. Thank you. Ewan, biodiversity? Yeah, yeah I, would, I would just, uh, <laughs> Saka pointed out that we're competitors and we're, we're going to sound very aligned on, on this particular topic because for us, it, is, it, it goes back to stewardship. Um, uh, we, as part of that, we, we do engage with companies and, and physical assets that, that we uh, put our clients' money into. Uh, but we also engage with the policymakers, so that is politicians, uh, but it's also regulators, and, and, and we're trying to drive higher standards through multiple mechanisms uh, to, to address these issues. And, and 
I, I, we're often asked, you know, about specific issues uh, such as biodiversity, but to me, many of them are very closely linked. So I, I find it very difficult to, to uh, extract biodiversity from deforestation, from climate risk. And, and that's why I think having overriding stewardship principles that allows you to engage with multiple parties for maximum effect, and that includes our competitors. I mean, we do collaborate much, much more now than we did say four or five years ago. I, I think we can use the collective investor voice uh, with many of these parties to, to drive real change. Thank you. Manuela. And something I'd like to come back to later about BlackRock is two things. One is Aladdin, how this huge and wonderful tool is coping with the vast increase in data and so on. And we've got a couple of questions on your new sovereign bond fund and how that will impact climate change issues. But um, biodiversity and BlackRock, is there a house view on, on worries about it or is it too early? Huge, huge topic, especially because it's quite early at the moment to have uh, uh, widely agreed reporting standards. We've seen progress on uh, green bonds where we have already started to ask him for biodiversity impact metrics. So this is an asset class where we're already seeing quite uh, good progress. Uh, the, the green bond principle, uh, the working group uh, will look to report uh, proposal for taxonomy on how these use of proceeds uh, category can be mapped against uh, biodiversity. So there's already quite some progress. Um, it is actually biodiversity and ecosystem is part of the six EU environmental objectives. So clearly there is going to be uh, an element of uh, uh, reporting and, and also product development that as we think about being more aligned, uh, to these objectives, uh, I think is going to stem uh, from that. So I would say that it's really accelerating. We started speaking about it like towards the end of last year, and we're already, and during the earlier part of this year, we're already starting to see uh, progress. But I think to the earlier point, uh, they tend to be quite, um, quite asset class specific because the data and just the uh, set up in terms of uh, reporting for each different investment type is already established. So it makes it quite easier to start reporting on this. So I think early progress, but uh, I would also echo the point that uh, it's very much an industry-wide initiative. So there's actually contribution from many asset managers, including ourselves. Thanks, Manuela. Michelle, the struggle against biodiversity law strikes me as we get that draw stamping ground for um, impact. Is that an area you've been involved in yet? Um, yeah, I was just thinking, what would I bring to this? So um, as bridges, um, our investments are mostly in uh, Europe and the US and, um, um, uh, and less in some of the emerging markets where a lot of this biodiversity is in particular um, uh, uh, critical. Um, and, uh, and, and, and a focus on it urgent. Um, so within our normal practice, of course, we have all the usual um, protections, for example, in real estate around biodiversity. But I suppose what I would bring to this group, this panel is um, the question of, is there more we can do in terms of pioneering um, new financial structures um, to protect, for example, biodiversity in the Amazon rainforest? And I'm, 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 uh, as Bridges, we've done a lot in the social space through um, social impact bond um, investing, where essentially um, you are investing to achieve a positive social goal and investors are repaid for achieving it. And I just wonder if there is anything that we could be thinking about, which goes um, through the green bond, the very fast growing green bond um, area into um, a, a clever structured performance based type of green bond for protection of forestry. I know there's been a little bit of work in this area in the impact investing sector. So there has been um, a, a, a social impact bond that was around um, saving the rhino specifically. So um, I, I think this is a very nascent 
but it could be a great area for those specialist impact investors like ourselves to work with some of the large institutional managers like the others on this panel and figure out whether there are more creative and pioneering things that could be doing um, using, using financial tools. Um, finally, I, I think investing, you know, for the opportunity to invest in sustainable forestry is, has been a very attractive investment category, forestry in terms of returns, and can be a very important part in protecting um, biodiversity. So I, I would urge um, everybody to be looking at, if you're thinking about client portfolios, you know, have, have you thought about um, sustainable forestry? Uh, uh, something that I know a little bit about because I have a non-executive role on the board of the UK's Development Finance Institution, CDC, which is now investing quite a bit and, and expecting to um, uh, escalate our investments in sustainable forestry in Africa um, and Southern Asia. Thank you very much. There are two quite big themes I'd like to address in the time left to us. One I'll come to at the end, which is your macroeconomic views for 2021, and the other is about the role of technology here. But, but Manuela, can I just ask you about BlackRock's new sovereign bond ETF and what impact that's planned to have on climate change? I've now had three questions about this. <laughs> it may, I not, have be, to say it that may not be your parish. If, given, um, again, I think uh, we should, uh, of course, I mean, it's it's very exciting. And of course, I, I work in products, so there is, of course, a lot of excitement. Uh, but I think it's important that even beyond the, the single product opportunities, we don't forget that uh, really what we're talking about here, and maybe as a good uh, bridge to your later question around technology, is that this is a space where we really need to make the most of the progress around the data. And so this is an example where we decided to partner with Beyond Rating, which is uh, what we thought was an extremely reliable source of data on um, government bonds. And I think we really wanted in a way to overcome uh, what we saw an obstacle in adoption by investors that really saw a big portion of their uh, asset allocation, which tends to be in government bonds, uh, uh, be prevented from having some level of uh, uh, sustainable consideration. Again, it's a, it's a first step, but I think it's, it really goes back to what we were discussing earlier. We really need to shift our mindset, because if you look at what an index like this one would have achieved, I mean, it would have been really differentiated because of certain duration profile, because of the bonds that you were including. So this is very much a bet that you need to make to express your conviction that those governments which are better prepared in the context of transition, in the context of meeting targets, are gonna be better positioned in their access to financial markets. So it really plays to the belief that these these are uh, factors which are not, not priced in today's valuation. So it really ties back to what we were discussing earlier, this whole notion of uh, we really need to change the mindset of many investors and uh, this type of uh, launches really plays uh, to these new ways at building portfolios which is far more forward looking. Thanks Manuela. Let's just address this technology matter right now, looking both inside our sector with things like AI and uh, machine learning and in the physical world with robotics, carbon capture technology and so on. How is, uh, how is Aladdin, for instance, adapting to um, the new world of AI and machine learning? And I know it's been adapting for many years to that. Sure, and uh, Aladdin, it's, uh, what it is, is uh, very much the risk engine that underpins uh, uh, everything at BlackRock, both in, the, in terms of investing, but also reporting to clients. And uh, what we've really been investing in has been uh, these, uh, to, to really enable the transition to a sustainable economy. We're really investing in giving access to more and more data. So we have really invested in uh, powering Aladdin with multiple data sources. So we've started making some of these data available on the web pages for all of our products. So investors can start making comparison on uh, issues such as business involvement or ESG rating as provided by certain data provider. So it's really twofold. Uh, the one regarding the investor integration work, it's uh, paramount that they are able to start seeing a lot of these uh, ESG factors uh, coming through in the context of their existing risk management framework. But also what has been new for us has been uh, these uh, uh, F 
effort around reporting and providing access to different metrics. It's at the beginning, we just launched it last year, uh, but yeah, we are heavily investing in, uh, first of all, selecting the data, but also what does it mean to make this data available to the broader public for us is uh, um, very much top of mind at the moment. Thank you, Manuel. I'm conscious of Saka's earlier remark about competitors, but I wonder if you and, and Saka in particular have got exciting developments on the AI and machine learning front, for instance. So I'll pass Good. it to you and all this because we don't use uh, we don't use um, Aladdin, uh, in in we have a, a slightly different system. But I'll pass to you on that. <laughs> Thanks, Saka. Uh, hospital pass. Uh, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not a technology expert, but for for us, um, you know, technology is about capturing and manipulating data more effectively than we have done in the past, and doing that in as effective a way as possible and generating these insights through, um, yes, machine learning and AI. So we have people with um, much more expertise in, in these areas in, in our firm who, who are feeding into our investment process. And that's that's key for us. The, out, the output has to be better investment decisions, but we're also trying to use it on the client front to, to generate better client interfaces. And that engagement is really important to us because it does drive things like product development. When I mean, Michelle was talking about uh, new financial instruments, that, that is that that is great. And we, we have been involved in the development of some of those, but they need to have client backing. They need to be relevant. They need to be commercially relevant uh, for it to matter to uh, in, investment firms and to plow those resources in. So it's a combination of better investment decisions and better client engagement. For, for us, that's what technology should deliver. Can I, can I put in and bring it to a forecast a bit? So I, I'd like us to think as follows, if we can. Um, the combination of AI and working from home and the hit that we have as a result of uh, COVID uh, is reshaping our economy. And there are some warning signs that it might not come out the way you want it to. So AI clearly can take the place of uh, not just manual but even uh, some parts of, of, uh, of thoughtful skill. Uh, I read the article written by AI in The Guardian. It was a very good article indeed. Um, it can take up a lot of the skill set in law, for example, in sales of investment, for example, in some ways in, in, in selection of stocks, for example. The working from home has echoes of the 19th century slightly, uh, where people work from home and gave uh, the owners of capital job lots of work that they had to give. Uh, remote working allows companies to have a lot of leverage if they're powerful about where they place the workers. That then brings us back to the original discussion about investments have to be thoughtful and long-term in nature and impactful to ensure that society that um, Adam Smith was so concerned about and its prosperity in the creation of the wealth of nations moves together so that we harness what we have. Otherwise, we end up with a lot of risks that we hadn't thought about. And this segues neatly into the macroeconomic picture. Can I just stay with you, Saka? How does, we're not looking for a market prediction here, of course, nothing like that. But how do you think it's going to shape up in 2021? So I think there will be a recovery because uh, the, the fall in, in, in economic production so far has been voluntary. If you think about it, we've volunteered not to have uh, spending. We volunteered to stay in the houses. Uh, I'm a historian by training uh, and brutally, um, you know, A, this is not a major uh, pandemic in terms of uh, the amount of, uh, of global deaths. And secondly, uh, humanity has lived with pandemics and produced and grew its economies anyway. The, so there will be a recovery just by the nature of how we go in and out and that you will see that. And that's partly what the markets are telling you. The problem that we have is that I think people are now more aware that they have to think about the possibility of an increase in uh, the incidence of pandemics like this because uh, this condition, actually funny enough, the biodiversity conditions tends to allow more of them to come. But I think in the short term, uh, we think a V-shaped recovery is more likely than not. Thank you. On this macroeconomic point, I'm going to come to Michelle next, then you and then Manuela. But before that, can I ask you to think about a final question, which is that if you were giving advice to one of the young people, um, uh, say about to graduate watching the Adam Smith show, where in the finance sector would you suggest they go where they could make the most impact on the climate challenge? But before that, um, Michelle, the macroeconomic outlook, how do your investee companies uh, look towards 2021? 
Yeah, so the first thing, somebody said earlier that this has been a very bifurcated um, uh, downturn. And, and I think we've, we've certainly seen in our own portfolios that, um, that certain industries have been hit very hard and others are actually doing better than they ever did. So the first thing to say is uh, there's, you know, it, it's, it, this is not a straightforward story as we've seen in, in other downturns or recessions where um, you, you just look at the overall uh, macroeconomics. Um, we've seen this huge bifurcation. We are less um, optimistic, I guess, than, than Saka. Of course, there must be a recovery at some point. Um, but certainly for the, the smaller businesses that we're investing in um, that are um, suffering the effects of COVID, um, it's a very, very long haul for them. Um, and there's um, been quite a lot of, not in our portfolio, but um, across the SME segment, a lot of debt taken on to get through um, the, the, the very real challenges for those parts of the economy that have been hardest hit. Um, and uh, we expect the... Um, the challenges of COVID to be going on for um, you know three to six months into the next year. So I suppose we we think that next year, first of all, depends a lot on the US election, but secondly, um, is likely to be a difficult year um, for a, certainly the SME segment for um, at least one and possibly two quarters before you see much of a recovery. Um, I also feel a little bit less, I suppose, sanguine about stock market levels. Because if you look at the real pain um, in, in, in our economy and other economies globally, um, it doesn't feel as if the stock markets are, are pricing in a lot of that. So I, I, I'm not um, personally convinced that the stock markets um, are right to be so sanguine about a recovery and are currently priced at the right levels. Thanks, Michelle. Ewan, what's the Aberdeen Standard view on this? Well, this is, this is where I really regret Keith's inability to turn up today because he is an economist to trade and he would have given you a much better informed answer than I would. Um, so there's a significant COVID caveat to this, but we do believe that an economic recovery is inevitable. Uh, the shape, uh, the aggregate shape uh, is much easier to predict than the, the more detailed shape of that. So if you look at demand for furniture during this period, it'd be very, very strong, but demand for airline seats and takeaway coffee has, has absolutely collapsed. So it, the, the aggregate uh, recovery takes into account these factors, but we do think that 2021 with the COVID caveat will be uh, a good bit easier and, and, and better and more profitable economically than 2020. Thanks, Ewan. I heard, and I'm sure we all heard, the head of IKEA on the radio this morning talking about how surprised he was at people piling into his shops whenever he reopened them. I can't imagine why they wanted to do that, but they did. Manuela. I wanted to build on what Michelle said and also a flag, the expect, I mean, increased volatility that uh, we expect to get into the next couple of months. There are big events ahead of us. So, of course, what I would also stress is the relevance of uh, for investors to think carefully about portfolio construction and this notion of accounting for um, some resilience, because undoubtedly we're going to we're going to end the year with the increased volatility. So some of the diversifiers are going to become particularly important. Uh, we also agree in that the long term uh, shape of the recovery is actually going to be at aggregate level is going to be a positive one. Uh, uh, but yeah, I think it's very important to say, to manage the uh, the pattern that uh, that we're going to experience to get us there, and so I think having some short short term uh, defensiveness built into the portfolio at the moment uh, can be it can actually be uh, quite a good idea, and um, and especially yeah, really learning from what has been have been some of the trends that we've learned uh, during the first wave which is the importance of being extremely selective in these uh, market environments. So um, even within a single asset classes, really capture the dispersion and so really uh, overweight uh, sectors and single names that have proven to have these uh, defensive benefits. So as we look to enter this period of high volatility, we would tend to favor uh, more stable names as well as higher quality names across uh, all asset classes, I would say. 
Manuela, thank you very much. We're about to crash the pips here. In fact, I've done so, so we'll get in trouble. I'll get in trouble. But um, in the running order we started with, you and Manuela, Saka, Michelle, you and where should the bright young thing go to make the maximum impact in the financial sector? Apart, of course, from your own firm. <laughs> well, I, I would say it doesn't really matter which part of financial services they join, just so long as they uh, uh, join financial services. And the reason for saying that is that we have a huge amount of influence and impact. So whether it's dealing with clients, uh, manipulating new forms of data, creating new products, I think we need climate consciousness in all aspects of that. And it's not just investments, uh, it's also in banking as well. We, we have the power to shift capital. So I would, I would challenge uh, Sacker on the uh, capital allocation point that he made earlier. I think we do do that in primary investments. And I think it can be immensely powerful when it's done correctly. So get into financial services, make your point and don't take no for an answer. Thanks, you and Manuela. I'm conscious this is an increasingly hard one to follow, but Manuela, next. That's really a hard one to follow, and I'm so glad <laughs> I have uh, two young children and I'm not the most popular one at home. So I do take it as a responsibility to really uh, change the perception of uh, what we do in financial markets. And I would say that the talent challenge ahead of us uh, is a particularly severe one. All the kids, they all want to go in fintech, they all want to go and do something else. So I think it's going to be our responsibility to make uh, finance appealing again for the, the young generation. So I would really echo what Ewan said, as long as they do join finance and they do actually uh, keep on improving the impact that we can have at, as, uh, as an industry, I would be very in favour of that. Thanks, Manuela. Saka? So I actually um, uh, I agree with you and we have a lot of capability of changing the world through stewardship. It's not through investment per se, but through stewardship. I would encourage uh, people to come into the stewardship part of the business. I would encourage women, I'd encourage colleagues uh, and fellow citizens of color to come in who are massively underrepresented. Uh, and I would say to them, this is our opportunities to build a better world. So come and build it and put your values at the heart of it. Thank you, tremendous. Michelle, I've put you in a very difficult position. Well, the obvious thing for me to say is that they should go into the impact end of, of, uh, of investing, but perhaps that's too obvious. I do, I do agree that if, if, if people should go into finance because there's so much power and please don't leave your values at the door. Please remember to bring them into the room if you do go into finance. I'm just going to end with maybe something a bit more controversial, which is um, why do I care about impact investing? Because it's actively trying to solve some of society's problems, as opposed to just trying to reform a little bit the industry that we already have. Um, so in all seriousness, that's what I'd like to see come into investing. But if we're going to succeed, we need to be honest that we need to collaborate with um, the nonprofit and with the government sectors. And so if you're not sure about going into finance, I do think Good people have also got to go into politics because we need good politicians as a financial sector. If we're going to be part of the solution, we're not going to be that solution on our own. Great. Thank you, Michelle. You know, there was a great letter in the Financial Times yesterday by an old friend, Peter Kriegsman, a very short letter saying that all politicians should use their lockdown time to study some very basic finance and do an exam in it so they would be able to rule us much better. Look, I really have run out of time here. My fault entirely. I can't thank you all individually, but collectively, you've been absolutely terrific panel. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry there's no applause. I should have turned, canned some applause and turned it on, but super. Thank you very much indeed, and I hope we'll have you back before next year, but live next year, we hope, when we do this physically. Mm -hmm.